comic books have got a very strange self-esteem issue. Now maybe I ought to start being intense. I hate Miller being more intense than I am. I call my style the deadline style. Whatever comes out on time, that's my style. He's casting a check and I'm sitting there doing the work at three in the morning. It was my normal grumble. Hate me, that's fine. Just be passionate. Love me, just be passionate about it. Don't be lukewarm. Don't tell me you want to see other guys. Daredevil has always kind of been the grateful dad of comics. So I, I was on board, you know, from the get-go. But I wanted them to take it seriously, because I took it seriously. Worked out pretty good. Ten-year overnight success, that's how it worked, yeah. I wanted something for Bill Everett to do when I when we first did Daredevil. I said to myself, here's Bill who had created the Submariner. He's one of the great talents in our business. And as far as I know, he isn't doing anything. I've got to dream something up for him. And a number of people had written articles in different papers and magazines about the fact that all of our heroes, all the ones that I had come up with were flawed. So I thought, well, i got to find a guy with another flaw. That seems to be what turns people on. Strangely enough, I was afraid that there might be a negative reaction to a blind superhero, primarily among blind people. I felt they would feel, you know, what's this guy trying to do? We can't do things like that. Is this some sort of a, a parody? And I, I was nervous about it. And then I was amazed to find we got more fan mail in the beginning from charities for the blind. They said that the people that we're involved with are so grateful that there is a blind superhero and they love that idea. And oh man, what a relief that was for me. It, 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 it felt good to get that kind of mail. It's a funny thing about Daredevil's costume. It started out being yellow, and I really am no authority on what color costumes should be. I used, I used to leave that, really, to the people who did the coloring in our office. And a lot of people said, we don't like the yellow costume. So being a man who makes very profound decisions, I said, okay, how about red? Now that, I, I hate to disillusion people, but that is the amount of intensive study and thought and research and focus group meetings that we had in determining a color of a costume. <laughs> people have said to me, did you ever imagine that Daredevil would last for 40 years? In all honesty, I never thought about it with any of our characters, because. It's hard to describe, but in the days that we were doing all these superheroes, when we started them, all that we were concerned about was that the books would sell. So we were so involved and occupied with making every issue as good or better than the last, that the thought of what will these be like in 40 years, it never, it never occurred to me, and I doubt that any of the guys was thinking of it at that time. What I always tried to do with Marvel was make it seem like a club, like a, an inner group that we knew about and the outside world wasn't even aware of. If you read Marvel, you were on the inside, you were hip. And it was sort of an exclusive thing, limited just to Marvel readers. And I tried to talk to the readers as if they were friends, not readers, so that not only, hopefully, did they enjoy the stories, but they enjoyed being part of, of the Marvel mystique, you might say. 
and I'm probably making it sound much more profound than it really was, but that's the way I looked at it. I, I wanted people to be aware of Marvel, and I wanted people to know about the mysticism and the magic and the marvelness of Marvel. And um, they say if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door, but the world will only do that if it knows the mousetrap exists. And I didn't want us to be doing these books in a vacuum, because, you know, comic books had no advertising budget, no promotion. There were no ads on television, on the radio, in newspapers. You just printed your comic book and it was out there. And I, I was sort of like Joan of Arc. I was on a crusade, a mission, to let the world know about the marvelous world of Marvel. So in that sense, I guess I was a little bit of a huckster. To me, placing the dialogue balloons was very important because it's part of the artwork. A lot of people don't realize that. They just shove the dialogue wherever they have room. But here's a panel with an illustration. And you have space that's empty and space that's filled with line work. When you put a dialogue balloon in with a pointer or a sound effect or a caption along the top or the side or the bottom, you're contributing to the artwork. That, in essence, becomes part of the illustration. I spent more time deciding where the dialogue balloons would go than I spent writing the dialogue. Writing the dialogue was easy. Sometimes I couldn't put too much humor in the story itself because it was a highly dramatic story and you don't want to break the mood. But I tried in things like the credits, and I wrote all those things. I wouldn't let anybody else touch them for years. Every credit was different than, than the one before, and I think I had more fun dreaming up those little gags for all the credits than anything else that I did, because I love writing humor. One thing I tried to do was always use a normal vocabulary in our stories. If I wanted to use a word like um, cataclysmic or any, any word that belonged, I would. And it occurred to me that if kids were interested in a story and they came across a word that they didn't understand, they would learn what it meant just through its use in the sentence, by osmosis, so to speak, or if they had to go to the dictionary and look it up, that's not the worst thing that could happen. I was one of the luckiest guys in the world because I worked with the most talented artists you could ever find anywhere. Colan, Romita, Bill Everett, Wally Wood. I didn't, I don't think I worked with Frank Miller. I think he came along after I left. And that's a lasting regret of mine because he too is wonderful. But. We, we at Marvel were indeed fortunate. We had the best artists. They, I mean, I would give them the, the, just a notion of a plot, and they went off and running, and they would illustrate it. And it, it was a great working arrangement.